Hello and welcome to a very special live edition of the Penguin Podcast. I'm David Baddiel and with me very excitingly is someone who was in Monty Python's Flying Circus. That should be enough really for me to be incredibly excited and it is. But he also has made loads of other films and TV including the vastly brilliant Ripping Yards and a series of award-winning travel documentaries that span locations such as the North and South Poles, the Sahara and the Himalayas. And it is his love of travel combined with a nose for a very entertaining tale that has inspired our guest to write his latest book, Erebus, The Story of a Ship. It is, of course, Michael Palin. Thank you. Now, as part of the Penguin podcast, we ask our guests to choose a handful of objects that have inspired them and talk about them. And Michael has kindly brought along some brilliant items, and they include all sorts of things. African stools, a piece of fuselage from Ernest Hemingway's plane, a postcard written by Spike Milligan. They have all sorts of things, but we're going to discover what these mean to Michael in a minute. But first of all, let's talk about Erebus. Tell us very briefly what Erebus was, why you chose to write this book. Well, I was researching a man called Joseph Hooker for a talk I was supposed to give at a club in London. And um, Joseph Hooker was the great botanist uh, in Victorian times. He really got uh, Kew Gardens going. And um, I I found out that at the age of 22, this very Victorian bespectacled gent had uh, signed on as assistant surgeon on a ship called HMS Erebus, which in 1839 left as part of an expedition to the Antarctic. Now, I'd never... I'd never heard of the ship, and I hadn't ever heard of the expedition to the Antarctic. In fact, it was extremely successful. They were away for four years, and the more I read about Hooker, the more I became hooked on on actually on Erebus itself, and the audacity of this little ship, which was a pure sailing ship, 104 feet long, went down to Antarctica, circumnavigated the continent, identified Antarctic as as a continent itself, had amazing adventures, nearly got crushed by two icebergs, and then came back in glory, was then chosen to go to the Northwest Passage with Sir John Franklin in 1845, and this was going to be a glorious chapter in British naval history, and in fact, it was quite the opposite. Mm. It was a total disaster. Uh, Both ships and 129 men disappeared, and it's the worst disaster in British naval exploration. So, I thought, there's a story here. In 2014, the Canadian Prime Minister went on air to let the world know that Erebus had been found, the wreck of this tough little ship that had this extraordinary life had been found underneath the waters of the Canadian Arctic. So, you know, a story with a beginning, a middle and an end, and, you know, another beginning. I love the sea, I always loved the sea. I love history, geography, all that sort of stuff. They suddenly came together. I thought there's a good story to tell. Well, you mentioned history there. I mean, this is a history book. It's a very lively, entertaining history book, because sometimes that might feel a bit dry. But had you ever written history books before? Because you've written novels, you've obviously... No. It was odd, because I, I read history at university, but also at university I was introduced to the wonderful world of comedy for the first mm. time. So I spent far more time writing sketches with Terry Jones and rehearsing for reviews and, and acting and, and just generally trying to sort of find out how you did good comedy than I did writing history. I did a history essay in the evening yeah. just so I could get by. Yeah. Uh, when I left Oxford, it was not to become a historian, but to work in comedy. Yeah. And that's what led to Python and all that. But So this is kind of coming back now to, to something that I think was always there in the back of my mind. And in fact, oddly enough, there's not a dis- total disconnect because... With Python, Terry, and Terry Jones and myself are both keen on sort of the, the history and geography side of it, as particularly. So, like, um, when it came to where we shot Holy Grail, we could have gone to a studio in South London or something like that. Instead, we went to Scotland, because Terry and I said, Scotland's wonderful. The scenery is fantastic. Yeah. And again, with Life of Brian, it was a historical essay in a way. In a way. Uh, in a way. <laughs> well, you know, was, uh, we read a lot of history books. Blessed are the cheesemakers. Did that actually happen? I'm not that sure. That didn't but, happen, uh, yeah. but blessed, are, uh, blessed bit did. Yeah, yes, that exactly. bit did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I really liked about the book, and I'm not a big reader of history and non-fiction, but it is a really good read, and I think because you get really into the characters. Do you want to just give us a sense of some of the characters that you meet along Erebus's story? There's a, a good cast. I, I was very, very anxious to make sure that they spoke for themselves. So I got documents and I got letters and I got records of the time which they had written rather than me to project on, onto what they were. So, so the characters just come out. There's James Clark Ross, who is the sort of hero figure. 
and this uh, very tall, handsome, dashing man. Uh, but anyway, he was a very good captain, very good navigator, but the most interesting man on board the ship was a man called McCormick, who uh, was the surgeon. He loved uh, the whole adventure of the journey, and as soon as the ship tied up anywhere, he'd be off out into the countryside. And so with Clark Ross, you get the rather formal reports which go to the Admiralty. With McCormick, you get this wonderful, lively interest in these amazing places he'd been to. Yeah. He, he'd like me, really. I'd go there and say, wow. Another very interesting character is obviously Sir John Franklin, yeah. who was older, more portly, and generally sort of a, a rather clubbable, affable man who had been an Arctic explorer like Clark Ross. Um, he was known as the man who ate his boots because in one expedition nearly died of starvation and were driven to eat their own sort of clothing. He wasn't quite such a, uh, a good captain as Clark Ross, and at the age of 59, he was given command of Erebus to, on the Northwest Passage. A lot of people felt that was very old mm. at that time. The next oldest man was 46 aboard the ship. There's a, a very important female character in the whole story, mm. which is Lady Jane Franklin, mm. who was Franklin's second wife, and she was a, a terrifically energetic, vital, vigorous woman with a, with a sort of great networker linked to Franklin. She was able to sort of use him, pushing him ahead. So she pushed him into becoming captain. Uh, she got him the captaincy of the Erebus on the last voyage. And it's her, where he died. really, who, when he goes missing, who keeps it going. I know, That yeah. the British government and the Navy should send ships out to try and find them. Yes. It's um, really her... Well, because I think, my theory is, that she just felt slightly guilty at the fact of having driven him to be there. So she was the first to encourage the search parties, of which there were many, 36 in 10 years. Wow. And um, one of the things you say early on in the book, which I think is really interesting, is you say this was the first time that men became heroes in Britain for fighting the elements rather than fighting other men. Yes. So where Nelson would have been the hero, you know, 20 years beforehand, yes. now it's men who are heroes because they're conquering the Antarctic or yes. whatever it might be, which is a very modern idea. It's a very interesting period of history, that, because there were no wars. Well, I mean, there were small wars, but no major wars after the defeat of France in, in 1815 and the start of the Crimean War. So there was this period where there was a great deal, many ideas coming out, enlightenment ideas about science, about how they understand the magnetic field of the earth, making maps, charting, discovery, exploration. It was a golden age, actually. Mm. That's a good moment to look at your first object, mm. which I believe is a travel book and it is. is part of what began your interest in travel. It is. This is Venice by James Morris, now uh, Jan Morris, and I think it's the finest travel book that I have ever read. And I'm very fortunate to have this first edition, I think about 1959. I read it, I hadn't traveled a lot, and it was, um, we just got married, 1966. And we thought as a treat, we'd go to Venice about a year later. And I'd, I was brought up in Sheffield, really hadn't traveled a lot. Venice seemed to be the most wonderful exotic city. So I thought, well, I must, I must read about it before I go. And the wonderful thing about this book is that it, it doesn't spoil it for you. I mean, it doesn't, nor, nor is it sort of a book which just tells you turn left and right and then you'll see the Rialto. It's fused with the spirit of Venice, writ, written in Morris's own particular style. It's a, it's a love story about Venice, really. And I found it absolutely fantastic. But, yeah, it was the first time we'd done a proper exploratory bit of travelling, and that's well, what Venice which, was. Which sort of brings us back to Erebus. I mean, is it the uncharted nature of what Erebus <clears> was <throat> trying to do that interests you as, a, as an explorer, as someone who has been to the ends of the earth? Yeah, I just am fascinated by the concept, the idea of the unknown, and what that meant to the people going down there. How did they deal with it? How, how could their morale be kept up? How could they you know, survive in, in icy regions where no one had really spent a lot of time before? spent a lot of time with the temperatures well below zero. They still had to climb up the rigging. Yeah. But it was, a, it was a, totally, a remarkable, remarkable Can you tell us about John, John Davis? He was a quartermaster on a ship called Terror. And Erebus, there were two ships, Erebus and Terror. Yes, that's, went, a, that's an important traveled, point. Travelled yeah. together. Yeah. Clark Ross was the captain of Erebus and a man called, an Irishman called Crozier was the captain of Terror. And uh, John Davis was a quartermaster on Terror. And his testimony is absolutely invaluable. It's one letter, basically, which he wrote to his sister at the end of one of the Antarctic voyages. 
he gives a sort of glimpse of what the spirit was on board that kept them going. And it's, it's fascinating because they're stuck in the ice, New Year's Day, 1842. They don't know where they are. They're further south than anyone's ever been in history. And what do they do? I'd have panicked. I mean, they, they, have, a, they have a wonderful party. Yeah. They throw the best New Year's Eve party possible. They yeah. come out on the ice. They carve a woman out of ice, yeah. eight-foot-long woman. And then they carve a pub and their bar, and they put up um, flags, and they call the bar Pilgrims of the Ocean, yeah. and they, have a, they dance. And the, the really interesting thing is they make a noise, because, I mean, I, I've been to the Antarctic. Have you been to the Antarctic? I haven't. You, you, anyway, the great thing is there's total silence there, a huge landscape, massive mountains, and absolute silence. And I think this is what drove them to make the noise that New Year's Day, and he describes them playing bugles and hitting drums, and they got pigs, they had pigs on board, and they oh, put yeah, pigs yeah. under their arms and squeezed them till they squealed. Yeah. It was just they wanted to make noise so they could yeah. say that we're alive, we're yes. here. Um, you referred to John Davis's letter, which is, you're right, you're so right, it's the, it is people just in a deserted, empty, silent place trying to say, we are here. It's diaries and letters that are your main source material, but of yeah. course you've written diaries very extensively. I, I've read uh, at least one volume of them, but there's two volumes, aren't there, of your diaries? Three, I think. Three, actually. okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you still write Yeah, diaries? I still write a diary, yes. Really? And it takes a certain dedication. I've always never managed to, mm. I've tried, and like just the sheer yeah. going back to every day, I don't have the willpower yeah, to do you it. Yeah, just, you have to keep at it, that's the thing, you really do. I mean, when I started in 1969, because I'd... I started it because I'd given up smoking, which I thought was a brilliant thing to have done, full of you know, willpower. And I had, we had a little one-year-old child, so I didn't want him to be sort of you know, sucking my cigarette butts and all that. So I'd given up that, and my willpower had been given such a boost. I thought, what, what, what I always wanted to do that I could do now with this new sort of strength and whiter than white um, willpower. And um, so I just keep a diary. Right. And the first, almost two weeks later, um, we got together and had the meeting which led to the formation of Monty Python. Right. So the first year of the diary is, is written when I'm filming Monty Python most of the time and doing the shows. And it's really interesting because they're very short entries most of the time and very little is about Python. It's mainly about my son Tom. He's like, I need to walk. Oh, yes, how wonderful. He just said his first word. Yeah. And all these classic sketches. People say, why didn't you write down what was it like when you yeah. first did Dead Parrot? Nothing yeah. there at all. It's all about Tom, you know, having yeah, you know, but that's fair thrown enough. up the night before. Yeah. Yes, no, it's fair enough. <laughs> yeah. But I'm glad I kept going with the diary. I kept thinking, why am I keeping this? Is there a self-consciousness that eventually sets in I mean, how do you stop that setting in when you start thinking, oh, you know, originally when you're writing, you're just writing your diary. Yeah. Then there's a point later on, there must be where you think, oh, hold on a minute, these have become like historical documents because yeah. I'm a member of Monty Python. And I, do you know what I mean? You must yes. think like these are going to be published. Yeah, I mean, Does so that, that change the way you write them? I, I hope not. I mean, there was, was there a review of the third lot of diaries, which said uh, Michael, he's just keen on saying all the famous people he met. But, I mean, I quite like meeting famous people. I was quite rather interested in them yeah. and all that. So when I write my diary now, I govern the number of famous people I write about. Right. <laughs> so I'm afraid right. you won't get in it. No, David, shit, not I was going to say, make an exception. <laughs> I want to see when I buy your no, volume No, you're the four. only famous yeah, yeah. person I've met today. Yeah. So that's, you'll, be, you'll be in there, In Dulwich definitely. with, I'm not going to mention yeah. who it was. <laughs> DB. Talk, talking, yeah. about, talking about mm. writing and, and mm. indeed comedy, your next item is a, I presume from somebody who was a comedy hero of yours at the time, is from Spike Milligan. Yes. Tell me about this, a postcard from Spike Milligan. Yes, nine Orm Court, dear Michael, ripping yarns are super, exclamation mark. More please, Spike. I don't have it with me. Oh yes, that's um, because tell the audience yeah, why that is. Well, Spike Milligan was a, a great hero of mine. The goon shows were the things that really excited me when I was young and made me feel I, I must do comedy sometimes, somehow. And uh, Spike, Spike was sort of uh, my idol, I suppose you could say, at that time. And I, got, I met him one or, once or twice, not a lot during Python, and then this suddenly came, and I did the first uh, series of Ripping Yarns, and to get something like that from the man himself was just wonderful, especially in his particular kind of style of long, sort of loopy writing. Anyway, the, the, um, the reason I can't bring it along here today is that um, recently I gave him an archive of my material up till the year uh, 1986 to the British Library, just because I had boxes full of all this stuff. 
And I thought, I'm never going to look after this. I'm never going to open these boxes uh, in the rest of my life. And they were very keen. They're very keen at the British Library now to get modern archives. And amongst the archives I gave them was the Spike card. Now, there's a thing. Once you've given them to the British Library, they are the product of the British Library. And you can't get them out. I, can't, I wasn't allowed to bring that tonight, <laughs> even though it's my own thing. And um, I was telling David earlier that um, they, it, they have a room called the Treasures Gallery at the British Library, which is full of things like Magna Carta. And recently they had a small exhibition. They have exhibitions of people whose, whose archives there. And they had Michael Palin, comedian, something, something, something. And there, alongside, Mag well, not alongside Magna Carta, but within 20 feet of it, is, <laughs> is the spam sketch written down, you know, under glass. Cannot be touched by the general public. There it is. You know. Yeah, thought, you, well, Michael also said to me that it, it was that if you look at the spam sketch now, that it is actually written out in longhand and there's no crossings out. I pointed out that's because it's just the word spam, like over and over <laughs> again. So it's not that hard to write out. No, but, there's, no. there's and. There's and. Well. There's and. There's that's true. And, there is and, and as well. Yeah. So when you got this, yeah, that's ripping yarns, which is a. F I love ripping yarns. Can I just say? Whatever you've done in comedy, mm. there's still someone who you think I'm so pleased that they have seen yeah. something that I've done. I, I just think generally it's rather, it makes you aware that it's good to acknowledge things you've liked and to bother to write. In mm. fact, the spike bothered to write. No, it's brilliant. That's wonderful. To get back to the book, the book actually is pretty funny. I mean, not throughout, obviously, it's a history book, but there are some really funny little moments here. I just wonder if you wanted to read a bit of it. Why not? <laughs> funny, you referred to McCormick. Yes. And like how he liked to get off the ship and go and go off on a little expedition of his own. And I'm just going to read a very, um, a little bit, which just gives you a kind of glimpse, well, of the comedy of it, but also where they were. One forgets they were in this extraordinary, difficult, dangerous seas. They uh, landed an island called Kerguelen Island, which I googled, and it's, it's 2,143 miles from the nearest civilization. So that's a place to go for a bit of peace and quiet. So far as the wildlife of the island was concerned, McCormick seems to have regarded it principally as a form of target practice. It's impossible to turn a page of his extensive journals without marvelling or perhaps despairing at his appetite for admiring God's creatures, then shooting them. <laughs> On the 15th of May, he identifies the Chione, or sheath bill, a singular and beautiful bird, so fearless and confiding. It seems peculiar to the island, to which its presence gives a charm and animation, especially to a lover of the feathered race like myself. This is followed next day by the succinct entry, I shot my first Chione. <laughs> a week later, accompanying Captain Ross and an exploring party, he shot two and a half brace of teal and turned and returned at 5 p.m. The day after that, I shot a gigantic petrel and a young black pack gull flying overhead. On the 30th, I went on shore about noon, shot a black pack gull from the dinghy and a shag at the landing place. And he wasn't finished for the day. On his way back to the ship, after calling on Captain Ross at the observatory, I, he shot two chionis, two gigantic petrel, two shags and a teal flying round the point. <laughs> so he sort of virtually wiped out the avian life of the Yeah, I think we should island. make it clear as well, a shag is a bird. By yeah, the way, just yeah, in case so you're thinking I, that he was yeah. sitting in other elements of his <laughs> life at that point. Wow. Do you have a sense of all these people, all these... Uh, yes, I do feel, you know, you've gone on the journey with them. I honestly feel I have. I've been... I've read their, their diaries, their letters, and I've got sort of involved in their stories, and I've got the ones I like, the ones I don't like. Um, and then do you feel for them when, on the second journey, they're all in danger? I mean, it's not the same, quite the same cast, obviously. You think yes. It's, I started to feel a bit yeah. like... Oh, no, I know they're heading to disaster. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly that. And all their, their letters in that, for the second voyage, they really, um, you depend on letters that they write before they've got to Greenland, yeah. because after that they just disappear. But the letters before Greenland are very, very interesting, and the officers are very gung-ho. Mm. And, oh, yes, we're going to see you, in, see you in China in, you know, um, next summer or something like that. We'll be sailing through the Bering Strait. And it's only when you actually read some of the crew's letters mm. that you actually realise the reality of the situation and that the crew very often realised far more the, what, what lay ahead and the dangers and the risks mm. that lay ahead. It seems this, you know, this idea of travelling the seas was something that you know, the Victorian gentleman wanted to do. That it, was, yeah. you know, it, it, it attracted some big characters. It was sort of like 
that's how you became a bit of a star. Yes. Was by being a big captain or an admiral or whatever. Yeah, it might be. You, you were the you were the star, and you would you would um, reports would come back, and they'd be in, you'd be headlines in the newspaper. And but the thing was that, that a lot of people, including Clark Ross and Crozier, they joined the navy at the age of eleven. Some right. of them, that was right. their school. Yeah. So they're absolutely sort of imbued with the navy. So the idea of sailing around stormy seas didn't seem to hold any terrors for them at all. Yeah. That's why I think the officers were almost more gung-ho than the poor old crew. Yeah, because the time sort of scales the that we're talking work. about are yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. It's all like we're going off on an expedition, some of these people would have just got married or just had children, yeah. and then they're off for like six years yes. or whatever. Yeah. And they don't even know uh, yeah. how long it's going to take to get back because it's all yeah. weather and ice dependent. Yeah. I think, generally speaking, they believed that they were invulnerable. Mm. And this is a very interesting aspect of the way the life on board ship was sort of the, the attitudes. You, you will find very, very few of the sailors, almost none of them, knew how to swim. Because to know how to swim was to accept there might be a circumstances in which the ship might sink and you'd have to swim. So, and you couldn't think that. That was a defeatist thing. That's extraordinary, So, isn't it? so know, it's a superstition you, yeah, not to learn to swim. Not to learn to swim. That, yeah. Then you'd be safer that way. Lots of superstitions That's extraordinary. at sea. Let's look at your next item, which I think is an African stool I have written Oh, yes. Yeah? <laughs> Sounds rather disgusting. It does it sound is, bad. It is an African sounds, stool. Oh, there thank it God. Is. It's that kind of African stool. Look at that. This is very beautiful. Where's it? that from? The Karamajong tribe in northeastern Uganda. Okay, and that's they, handmade, presumably. It's handmade, and it's carved from one piece of wood, and it's got a little bit of decoration. You know, there's a bit of a sort of chamfering there. The guys just carry it around with them, and um, and they just sort of uh, held it uh, as they wandered around so unselfconsciously. Um, these very tall men, and it's very short. It is very short, yeah. but then doesn't take up much space, and they were just put it under there, and they'd sit on it, and it's actually incredibly difficult to yes. sit on. I'm, I'm, as I'm I'm, getting, but I've managed. Uh, brilliant. But later, I, uh, thank you. <laughs> I cannot tell you just how perfect form and function it is. You know, these guys walked along, they were talking. That's why I'm doing this slightly strange yeah. walk, because yeah. they're talking away, you know. I must say, on the other hand, they would have a Rolex watch. Oh, they they? all have okay. Rolex watches yeah. and these little things. And then whenever they needed a meeting, they just sat down. So you had your chair with you all the time. What, what is that? Eight inches high? Yes, yeah. probably. Yeah. yeah eight and or nine inches high and about eight or nine inches the actual seat itself. Yeah. 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 They would just sit down, carry on chatting, get up yeah. again. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where, where do you think it comes from, this desire to explore very different cultures, cultures where men carry around tiny stools with just, them. I'm just curious. I just always have been curious about, you know, what's around the next corner, over the next hill. It just started very, very early on. I was fascinated by the, the world, and, and particularly the unattainable world, that a schoolboy living in Sheffield would never, ever dream of, yeah. you know, going to the North Pole or the South Pole or the Gobi Desert or whatever. But I knew that I wanted to be an explorer, um, I wrote that down in my notebook once I was being an explorer. Well, um, how, old were, how old were you when you wrote that? About nine. Right. Yeah. What had come into your life to make you imagine these other well, worlds at that point in time? Stories, just lots of stories. I mean, big, would I have been reading big old stories at that time? Possibly. Certainly um, maps at mm. school, school, the globes, all that sort of thing, National Geographic magazine. And, and also because living in Sheffield was quite important because on, on the western side near where we lived were the Pennines and a lot of reservoirs and quite a wild moorland and heathland. And it was very accessible. I could go out there on my bicycle. Nobody seemed to worry about you going out on a bicycle when you were 12 or something like that. So I, was, I would go there and I would let my imagination go and places would become sort of canyons where I was going to be attacked and have to get out the way quickly and all that. I would when, just make up stories. When you first... When was your first TV travel series? When was it? 1989. 1989. So did you just decide, or did the BBC ask you... Because presumably you'd finished Ripping mm. Yarns and whatever film you were making at that point in time. I'd done, done A Fish Called Wonder, and I'd done yeah. about five films in succession. And um, I just didn't know what else was around. There were certainly no, no films to match up to Fish Called Wonder. Someone at the BBC just came up with the idea of Around the World in 80 Days right. and retracing Jules Verne in the present day and asked, and they approached me and said, would you like to do it? And I said, um, 
you know, what's involved? So just you, you go around the world and, and try and do it in under 80 days. I said, you, you know, pay me? I said, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Straight. Uh, yeah. I'm on. I mean, why not? Why would you, why not? Why, why exactly. would you say no to And that? they said they fought very hard to get me because they felt I had all the right ingredients. Curiosity, sort of charm, wit, mm. humour. <laughs> and good. it turned out, it turned out, we were in Madras or somewhere, and the director had had a few beers, and he admitted I was the fifth person <laughs> that they'd actually asked to do it. You know, I was way behind. Even Noel Edmonds was the no. third. He was the third person. No. He wasn't even the fourth no. person. No. No, oh, yeah, dear. yeah. You've got another item, one of the things I'm most interested in, which yeah. is the weirdest, I think, item you've brought along so far, <laughs> yes. which is you've written a couple of novels, haven't you? But this is yes, a I novelist's have. fuselage. <laughs> yes, here it is. Now... This is rather remarkable, but this is a piece of the fuselage of a plane in which Ernest Hemingway was travelling in 1953 when he crashed um, on takeoff to a place near called Butiaba in, um, in Uganda. This is what it is, just a bit of, bit of fuselage. We were making a film about Hemingway and his travels, and no one had ever gone to this site where he had this crash. And Hemingway was a bit of a, you know, as you know, rather macho man, but he was always sort of, he would head on, go into things, and, and sort of, yeah, let's go on, let's do it. He was circling over a waterfall called the Murchison Falls, which is the most extraordinary place where the Nile, which is about a mile wide, is channeled through about a 100-yard cleft in the rocks. I mean, it's an absolutely extraordinary place. And he was going around, and he was filming it, and the plane got caught in some trees. It wasn't a serious accident, but he just was brought down. He was stuck there. And word got round the world that Ernest Hemingway had died in an accident and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, he, he hadn't died, but lots of people converged on the area, including another chap he called, I can't remember, it's from Patterson or something like that. Anyway, jolly keen man. He said, look, I, I'll take you to your next place. I'll take you back to um, Kampala. You, you, you know, stick, stick with me. And so um, 24 hours later, Hemingway got on this other plane and they crashed on takeoff. Right. So he had two, wow. uh, two plane crashes in, in a day, <laughs> or a day and a half, really. But that was Hemingway for you. Well, yeah. And the plane was burning, and he crashed his way through it, he bashed it through it with his head, wow. got terrible scars and all that, and burnt himself. And anyway, we went to this place where that, that particular what, what was this show? happened. Or it was, was the show called Hemingway? It was Hemingway. called The Hemingway Adventure. It was a six-part series. The people there said, you're the only people who've ever shown any interest in this part of the Hemingway. We've never had anyone come around. I'd never heard of that. I'm no, no, not a Hemingway I, I, buff, but I, well, I know a bit about him. I, I've I, never heard I anything. knew about it because he died seven years later uh, at the age of, uh, I think, 51 years old, very young. But I think it was that accident. He never totally recovered from that. Right. I mean, he battered himself throughout his life. Yeah. There was a great scar across his forehead which is wonderful, like the Nike sign. Oh, really? And he got, he got that when he was quite young. He was 28 years old. He was in a toilet in France. And he'd had a few drinks. He kept pulling the chain. And you know, nothing was happening. So he pulled it really hard. And it wasn't the chain to the toilet at all. It was attached to a, a skylight about uh, 10 feet above him. Just fell down, hit him on the head. <laughs> <laughs> and left this scar. Don't often hear that about how Hemingway got his scar. No, he'd be wrestling with six well, buffaloes. Exactly, I imagine that yeah. Hemingway told people it was a bullfighting yeah, incident. Well, but yeah. So where did you get that? A man there we were talking to, and he said, my father gathered bits of the wreckage, and they kept it in the house. And he said, here's a bit. <laughs> Do you want to take that home? And, and I did. I mean, imagine what they said, ask, open your bags. What's that, Michael? Oh, it's a bit of an aircraft fuselage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, that's but anyway, amazing. that's, that's um, the closest I got to Hemingway, who I, you know, I'm rather fond of Hemingway in his mad Well, Hemingway in his way. own mad way was also an explorer and also yeah, a man who... He was a great... He, he wanted yeah. to write, but he wanted to be in odd places, to yeah. learn about other cultures, yes. and to some extent to experience danger. I don't sense that's necessarily a part of your interest in travel, although you must have been in dangerous situations. Is there any times that you felt, oh, no, this is getting really dodgy when you've been in the Antarctic or... Well, uh, I, I remember when we filmed at the North Pole. As you know, the North Pole is just on open sea, and we filmed in May, and it was, ice was supposed to be covered over the whole area, and so that we could land a plane at exactly where 90 degrees was, and I could do my piece to camera and all that. I couldn't see a float that was big enough to take a plane. And these guys were circling around and circling around. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, we found one, one down there. So we go down, and they suddenly abort it to take off. I said, oh, thank God. 
I don't want to do this, this is mm. ridiculous, land on a moving airstrip. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, is it too small? They said, we need sunshine before right. we can land. And I said, surely, come on, it doesn't have to be look good, let's just do it and go, yeah. and just wait for the sunshine. You know, the sunshine is important because in that way you can see the shadows which will show you the ridges on the ice. So okay. I said, all right, let's wait for the sunshine. So yeah. we circle around where the North Pole is. I'm waiting to land on a moving ice flow yeah. um, when the sun comes out. And we did eventually. And right. God, I mean, if that you actually terrifying. look at the footage... If, presumably the ice could have cracked. The ice could have cracked. Yeah. Uh, perfectly. But it was but fine. They, it was all right in the end. And well, I it did brings my... us back. It brings us back to yeah. Erebus, which, of course, was a sh ship that managed to get very far south successfully and then very yeah. far north unsuccessfully, yeah. and it actually did get trapped in the ice. Yeah. And you finish by talking about seeing it. Yes, on. yes, 2014. 2014. September 2014. And how you'd so. like to go back yes. and dive yes. to, to see it. I mean, yeah. it seems very like it'd be very cold <laughs> to me, yeah. but yeah. you genuinely would. I genuinely would. I okay. can think nothing what was more important to me as I started this book than to know that at some point I could go and touch that ship under the water. Right. And by the end, by the time I'd finished the story, I felt I had to. I just had to sort of give it, grab it. Give it know, a hug. He, yeah, give it a hug. I <laughs> yeah. mean, he, the, these guys who'd sailed in that ship and probably died in that ship you know, had been protected by this hull for so long, I thought, oh, I've got to do it. The Canadian archaeologists do dive down there when they can during the summer. I have applied and said I can, oh, have. I can scuba dive, you know, I'll do it. Yeah. And they're very nice, but they don't return my calls, really. Oh. I think a comedian... They're probably a bit worried about Comedians you. are very down, low down the list of people they want to uh, yeah. have diving. Because there's a picture of a yeah. diver yes. in the book. It looks like it's preserved in a way, I mean, in the way that shipwrecks are under the yeah. water. No, it's, it's, it's preserved very well there, both by the, by the intense cold, because for 10, almost 11 months of the year, it's just iced over. Mm. And also there's very low oxygen in the, um, in the water, so nothing much there to deteriorate or to uh, work away at the woodwork. So it's actually reasonably well preserved. I went up to the North West Passage to try and get to the wreck site, and we were unable to get there mm. because of the ice. Yeah. Now you'd think, well, this happened with Franklin, got stuck in the ice. We would have got stuck in the ice as well in 2016 when I went there. But the reason being, although there's global warming and the Arctic is warming faster than anywhere else, it means that there's a lot of ice floating around in the Arctic, melting off the big glaciers. But big chunks of ice in which if they get together and they're caught in a small channel, they bind together, they freeze, and this is exactly what happened to Erebus and why the men all died well, and had to abandon the ship. And it was just the same in 2016. Yeah. I mean, it's, not, I mean, it's very extraordinary at the end of the book... Um, because no one knows exactly what happened, but essentially the sense is it got stuck in the ice and then yeah. the men had to try and find yeah. some way of surviving in Inuit territory on mm. the ice, mm. and they didn't, is the long and short of it. They didn't, because they didn't know what to do once they were off the ship. Yeah. This was part of the hubris of the whole thing. I'm sure they were very brave men, but they, they didn't take basic precautions and they certainly didn't learn Inuktitut, which is the Inuit language, which might have helped them. Once they were off the ship, they were lost. Yeah, but there's a really extraordinarily interesting thing in, in the book, which is there's the possibility that some cannibalism was involved with some of the men, mm. but that's not entirely certain. But the thing that interests me sort of more than that is that the person who first discovered them, Ray, is that his name? Yes, John Ray. Mm. When he brings this story back, which is put because he works with Inuit people who have seen the, the English and the British people around, when he brings this back to England, basically the English won't believe it. They think English gentlemen could never have behaved in such a way, and they assume that the Inuits have made it up, or maybe the Inuits yeah. were eating the English. And it's a really fascinating uh, sort of yeah. colonialism of a sort, of like imagine yeah. the English could never behave, yes. even in those circumstances, in an un-English way. And the most vehement and vociferous defender of the English way who gave the Inuit real stick was Charles Dickens. Oh, really? Dickens oh, was, I didn't know that. Yeah, Dickens was um, urged by Lady Jane Franklin to give his opinion of what a, uh, uh, what a, a terrible slur this was, and he, he was a really violent anti-Inuit piece he wrote. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. Dickens himself, this man who knew people so well, was yeah. was not um, going to entertain the fact that uh, cannibalism could have taken place. Very un-British. That Charles Dickens note is quite bleak, but nonetheless, I'm going to end it there. It's been a really incredibly fascinating talking to you, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Palin. Thank you. Thank you. 
out now in audiobook. The Lost Words by Robert McFarlane and Jackie Morris. Read by Guy Garvey, Edith Bowman, Benjamin Zephaniah and Keris Matthews. All over the country, there are words disappearing from children's lives. The Lost Words is a joyful celebration of the poetry of nature words. With acrostic spell poems by peerless wordsmith Robert McFarlane, this enchanting audiobook captures the irreplaceable magic of language and nature for all ages. Wren. When Wren whirs from stone to furs, the world around her slows. For Wren is quick, so quick she blurs the air through which she flows. Yes. Rapid Wren is needle, rapid Wren is pin. And Wren's song is sharp sung, briar sung, fawn sung. And Wren's flight is dart flight, flick flight, light flight. Yes. Each wren etches, stitches, switches, glitches. Yes. Now you think you see wren. Now you know you don't. Across a rich and vivid soundscape recorded from nature, Edith Bowman, Guy Garvey, Keris Matthews and Benjamin Zephaniah, iconic voices of modern Britain, bring the magic of nature and language to listeners.